I've got something to share with you. It's called a cold, um, but I'm going to try to keep it to myself all the same. I, I was kind of excited, uh, well, very excited about being able to speak, and I looked at the schedule. They were sending me the, the timing, and I thought, early on Thursday morning, nobody's going to be there to hear me. They'll all get there about lunchtime and then enjoy the rest of the day. And then I saw just how much they admired me and appreciated me because the warm-up act for me was Dale Jenkins. <laughs> I tell you what, there aren't a lot of people who can claim that. I, I, I want to talk this morning about preaching, of course, and hopefully share with you some ideas and thoughts that, that maybe you haven't thought about that will be helpful to you. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, I've got, I got, I got to tell you, Dale, there's something you've got to stop doing and that's putting up PowerPoints with strange Norwegian dialects on them. I spent part of the sermon trying to interpret that sign on that door instead of listening to you. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but I, I thought just all of a sudden Norwegian might just suddenly fill my brain and I would actually know what to say about it. It didn't work that way. Okay. Other than that, you did a good job. Okay. Um, he, he also got my mind going off a little bit when he talked about running scared, because I remember running scared. I don't run scared anymore. And the reason why is trust. And the trust you've got to have is not in the church. I wish it could be in the church, but it's not. Not, not the church as the individuals that you're working with. Um, the trust you've got to have is in God. Because your brethren will let you down from time to time. And what you've got to understand is that even when your brethren let you down, your father won't. Now, I, I've been through enough that I realized that the plans that you have for yourself and the plans that God has for you may not be the same. If, if I don't mess up really badly at the end of what I'm about to do, I'm going to ask you a question, and that is what your goal as a preacher is. And, uh, and depending on what your goal is, it may or may not be achievable. But I'll probably forget, so if I do, maybe you can flag me down before I get off the stage and I can ask you that question. But... Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you what I think is one of the keys to preaching a sermon that will get your audience's attention. And, and it's pretty simple, actually. And it works like this. If you are not interested in something, your audience isn't going to be interested either. If it doesn't mean something to you, if you're not enjoying it in some way, it's not going to mean anything to them. They're not going to enjoy it either. Now, so one of the things, that, this is one approach that we take, is we say, okay, i tell you what's important to me right now. I don't like the way this nation's going when it comes to same-sex marriages. So I'm going to preach on that. And you, boy, you can do a good job, and you can do a fiery sermon, you can do a good sermon, a biblical sermon, and the people, the first time they hear it, will be very impressed. And the second time they hear it, they'll be suitably impressed. And the third time they hear it, they're not quite as impressed. And you, you see what I'm saying? If we just go on those things which excite us the most, we'll deliver some great sermons. But eventually, those are going to kind of wear thin. Okay. So, sometimes we have to step back and we have to teach the basic sermons. I was up at a, at a congregation in Tennessee preaching for a while, and they, the elders called me in. Well, I remember that those elders meetings. Uh, Steve, the elders need to meet with you after the service tonight. You go in there, uh-oh, what happened? Brother Johnson and his wife are having marital troubles. Oh, good. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but they called me in one Sunday. They said, listen, Steve, we've got some people that are concerned. Uh, they don't like the way you're uh, preaching. They don't like the way you're using personal examples. See, I don't, I don't like to tell preacher stories because I don't know if preacher stories are real. And I can't feel good telling a story that I don't know is real. I like to tell stories. Your brother David did a really great job with story preaching, didn't he? he was, I, I remember the, the sermon, the day the book was opened. Great sermon. And, and by the way, I've preached that. If you haven't preached that, you need to get a copy of it and plagiarize from Brother Roper's brother. <laughs> now, 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 Brother Roper, he had something else that interested him, and that was he had a little bit of a, what's it called, a thespian in you, right? And so uh, that's an actor in case any, I lost any of y'all there, okay? <laughs> And he would like to do Job. I wish I had ever seen his Job performance because I had to listen to the boring Job lectures he gave. But, uh, <laughs> but he, he, would, he would present himself as Job and do a great job with it. And he, the reason why it was so 
and draw you in is because he was enjoying what he was doing. So this is what I want you to understand. If, if you've got a topic that isn't maybe foremost in your mind, but it is something because you need to share with the congregation the whole gospel, not just those things that are important to you, but things that may be important to them, things that may be important to Christians who are just starting out and don't know everything that you know, and, uh, and their faith isn't as strong as your faith or the ones around them. You've got to preach all those basic principles again, too. If that's something you don't enjoy, then here's what I want to suggest to you. Find a way to enjoy it. And the way you do that is you evaluate yourself and you find out the things you like. Well, those, those elders asked me not to preach any more sermons like I was preaching. I thought, how can I do that? That's me. That's who I am. So I went to the old formula preaching where you have um, a joke, which was always a mistake for me. I can't tell a joke. I never remember the punchlines. I never remember the things you've got to say to make the punchline work, you know. So the jokes are not a good thing. But a joke, three points. And uh, if you get one emotional story in there, do well. They, 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 they gave me, now I'll tell you this, they gave me the clue or the, the trick to telling stories that I knew and knew were real without putting myself in them. Just say someone I know. Okay, so that works. Try that if, if, you, if you talk too much about yourself. All right. But anyway, so I tried that for about three months. We got, we got a new youth minister at the time. After three months, I said, I said, you know, you, you've never heard me preach. So I've been here three months. I, I know, but you've never heard me preach. The elders called me in. They said, oh, Steve, we're so excited. We haven't had one complaint since we talked to you last. And I thought, boy, if you listen to my mind, you'd hear all kinds of complaints because it wasn't me, you know. And so I said, I said, well, that's good. And I said, I can kind of continue along that line, but listen, I, I'm going to have to preach one sermon a month that I feel is the kind of sermon that I need to be preaching. They didn't say yes or no, but I went ahead and went with it. They called me in the next week and said, Steve, uh, we, <laughs> it's time to let you go. Okay, that's going to happen sometimes. I understand that. We'll talk about that at the end if I don't forget to. Right. But find something that you like. If you've got to cover a topic that is important but not maybe your favorite topic, find something that you like. What I want to do right now is I want to share with you a sermon that I preached called Green Eggs and Ham. I've got the outlines here. After, so I, I followed Adele's knowledge here. I think I'm having heart trouble. Um, if you're a boring preacher, don't give uh, the, all the words to you ahead of time. So I'm going to give you the full outlines. That's why you haven't got it now because you'll be reading it instead of listening to me. But that's what's going on. What I did was I tried to take something that I like and use it in order to convey very basic, simple truths in a way that I find interesting, in a way that hopefully my audience will find interesting. Dr. Seuss, when you're raising kids, boy, I love Dr. Seuss, and this is one of the books that, that I have enjoyed. Moms like green eggs and ham. You know the basic story. You've got this unnamed character. He's sitting there in a chair minding his own business. Sam I Am comes roller skating by with a sign saying, I am Sam. He goes back by, Sam I Am. And then he goes back by and says, do you like green eggs and ham? The guy said, I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. Okay, and then Sam I am spends the rest of the book trying to persuade this fella to eat green eggs and ham. Would you, could you, in a box? Would you, could you, with a fox? Not in a box, not with a fox. I do not like green eggs and ham. I will not eat them, Sam I am. Okay, I love that. I don't know why. Okay. Well, mamas love it, and I think the reason they love it is because the story kind of has this guy not wanting to eat some food, and then he eats it and likes it, and all the mamas are hoping that the child will take a lesson from that. And when she cooks those rutabagas, uh, they will go ahead and try those rutabagas, even though they can tell from the smell they're not going to like them. Okay? That's why mamas like it. But I think there is a sinister subplot of this thing, and that has to do with peer pressure. Uh, they are about to release the long-lost sequel to Green Eggs and Ham. Not true. Um, and uh, in, in it, we find out that the main character winds up having high cholesterol from eating all those green eggs and high blood pressure from eating all that salty green ham. Okay? He gave in to peer pressure, and it cost him. Well, you know, peer pressure is an amazing thing, and the devil has not has not ignored the value of persistence. When you constantly come to somebody again and again 
And again, like Sam I Am did, this persistence thing, the devil has found it to be a very useful tool. And so what I thought I would do with the congregation is I thought I'd just share with them, what if the devil approached you like Sam I Am? Okay? Take, for instance, the topic of murder. Oops, and go back. Not too far. Not too far. Okay. The devil comes up and he says, I'm the devil. The devil I be. Will you kill this man for me? Now, I know that's not good grammar, but the devil's never followed rules very well anyway, so why would he follow grammar rules, okay? But now, as a Christian, you hear this, there's no way. Kill a man? Are you for real? I could never, ever kill. I would not, could not. That's a sin. I must love my fellow men. Would you, could you, someone mean? Especially if you were not seen. Moses fell for that. Remember he was out one day, he saw an Egyptian beating up one of his brethren. He looked this way, he looked that way. And when he didn't see anybody, he killed the man and he hid his body in the sand. Now I suppose you can get some theologians to argue over not, whether or not that was appropriate. Stephen, in the book of Acts later on, he says Moses thought that he could convince his people that he was going to lead them at that point, but they didn't go along with it, so he went off in the wilderness and it wasn't exactly what he had planned. Now, God was able to use it in his plans. No, no, I, I would not kill him. No siree. God made him in his image, see? Now, you could actually quote some verses on that. I did in my sermon. You go back to Genesis 1, verses uh, 28 and 29, uh, where God says, let's make man in our own image. In the image of God, he created him. A male and female, he created them. You go over to the, the, a little bit later in Genesis when Noah gets off the ark and God's talking about how when somebody kills a man, there's a big problem there because that man was made in God's image. You can go to the book of James when James is talking about the tongue, and you can talk about how uh, there, James says, you know, there's something wrong when you take that same tongue and you praise God with it, and then you curse your brother who was made in the similitude, the image of God. There's a problem with that. Could you hate him, wish him ill, don't you know that thoughts can't kill? This man has done such awful things. He's no angel, see, no wings. By the way, I'm a well-noted speaker. Uh, Dale, Dale pointed out at CYC that Kyle Butt was a, a photographic memory kind of person. I'm a photogenic memory kind of person. I don't remember anything, but I look good not doing it. Um, <laughs> no, I will not hate him. Hate is wrong. I will love him all life long. But what if he hurt those you love? Could you if push came to shove? I would not hate him even then. I have to love my fellow men. But yes, I'd like to see him caught and punished for the wrong he had wrought. What about that man at work, that fellow who's a big fat jerk? Could you conceive a vengeful notion? For he who cost you your promotion? <laughs> you know, I must admit that love is hard to muster for that tub of lard. <laughs> but I would never lift a hand to carry out the thoughts I'd planned. The Bible tells us in James chapter 1, verse 15, that when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's, uh, it's full-grown, it brings forth death. So even allowing those thoughts in our minds to kind of fester there, that can be a problem. The devil knows that. So he's persistent. He keeps trying to pick at us and, and chip away a little bit more. And he goes on. He says, well, who can blame you? It's much too hard to love that big fat tub of lard. Hey, I like the way you use that name. Could you do more of the same? They're only words, and words can't harm. Your conscience needn't sound alarm. But, of course, you know as well as I do that your conscience ought to sound alarm because Whoever says to his brother, Raka, is in danger of, of the council. And whoever says to him, you fool, is in danger of hell fire. But that's how the devil works. Might not get you to murder somebody. Not physically. But he might talk you into hating someone. He might talk you into harming someone. He might talk you into a, a kind of assassination we know as character assassination. Well, what about adultery? Could he get you to go for that? I, I would hope not, but uh, of course, let's take a look at it and see. I'm the devil, Lord of strife. Would you step out on your wife?
Step out on my wife? No way. I'll love her to my dying day. Well, would you, if she was a nag or a hideous old hag? I would not, could not. That is sin. I love that woman to the end. I love her deeper than her skin, and deeper than the mood she's in. But what if that mood would not go away? What if she nagged day after day? From such a constant state of grief, a man has got to have relief. Now, I know a girl who works with you who would listen to what you go through. Could you spend time with such a friend? It just might help your heart to mend. Now, I hope I never know this firsthand, but they tell me, statistically speaking, that most affairs don't begin in a bedroom. Most affairs begin at a table eating lunch with a coworker, chit-chat around the cooler, talk with a coworker as you're working all day long, and, and that coworker lends a sympathetic ear something that you don't feel like you're getting at home. And so you want to spend more time with that person. And more time leads to other things, and eventually you have an affair. The devil realizes that most men aren't just going to set out to step out on their wives. But if he's persistent, and if he offers just the right stumbling blocks, he can get good men to do bad things. No, no, my wife's my help. My wife's my mate. And though she hasn't been of late, we'll manage if we only try. We'll manage. We, my wife and I. But think of all she puts you through. Do you think that God planned that for you? No, he wants your life filled with joy. And this sweet gal could do it, boy. Your wife has gotten on your nerves. But look at her and all those curves. You know where the devil's headed with this. And your response may be something like this. Well, what you say sounds right, but still, we'll make it through. I know we will. But the devil knows. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 28. I say to you, that whoever looks at a woman to lust after, he's, he's already committed adultery in his heart. And the devil knows if he can get you to look at that other woman, even though you plan to stay true to your wife, if he can get you looking at it long enough, it's going to go in a bad direction. Oh, now I see you love your wife. But would you wish for her this life? Would you wish a life of strife if you really loved your wife? Or would you set that captive free to be all that she was meant to be? A quick divorce could do it, lad. And in the end, you'd both be glad. That's how the devil works. But we understand something about divorce. Matthew 5 verse 32, but I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. And then in Matthew 19, 9, I say to you, whoever, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another, he commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. You know these passages as well as I do. Divorce may seem like an easy option. That maybe you'll both be happier in the end. That's the way the devil wants to present it, but that's just not the way it works. Of course, Malachi. Chapter 2 and verse 13. I know everybody else says it, Malachi, but I like Malachi for some reason. I just can't get rid of it. Well, Malachi, chapter 2 and verse six, uh, verses 13 and ver- through 16, talks about things like this. Yet you say, why are you upset, Lord? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she's your companion and your wife by covenant. And the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence. If you read on the rest of that verse, verse 16, it tells you because of that, you need to take heed to your spirit. He also warned you of that back in, in the uh, prior verse, back in verse thir- uh, pardon me, 15. Take heed to your spirit. Be careful. Watch what's going on inside. Because when it comes down to it, God really does hate divorce. It's dealing treacherously with the wife of your youth. Well, there are other de- areas the devil could come at us with, and uh, one of them might be lying. Oops, got there too quick. I'm the devil. The devil am I. Would you tell your friend a lie? Tell my friend a lie? No way. I always do just what I say. 
But what if you should change your mind? Well, that would put you in a bind. Suppose it cost you things you'd miss. Would you break your word for this? I would not, could not change my mind. Even if I'm in a bind, the Bible says that telling lies will cost you favor in God's eyes. All liars, not just the little white liars, not just people who lie a little bit on the side, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is second death. Well, now you need not jeopardize your soul. I'm sure that there's a big loophole. Did you say you would or swear? There might be something useful there. Did you really promise him? People say things on a whim. And if you didn't, he'll admit it, that you never swore on it. Well, Matthew 5, verse 33 says, Again, you've heard it said, Those of old you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oath to the Lord. And, in verse 34, I say to you, don't swear at all, neither by heaven or for its God's throne, or by the earth for its God's footstool, nor by Jerusalem for its city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you can't make one hair white and black. But let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Whatever is more than this is a sin. I've got one more area in the outline that we could talk about. I'm not going to go there right now. What I want to do is I want to take it to the conclusion and share something with you, in case you didn't already figure it out. But I know you guys are smart enough you've already figured this out. Because I wasn't preaching my own sermon. I was preaching someone else's sermon. I was preaching Jesus' sermon on the mount. Just each time we went back to Matthew 5, Matthew 5, Matthew 5. Just covering some basic ideas there that Jesus covered in a little different way. Franklin Camp used to talk about old truths in new robes. He had a couple of books that came out, great sermons. Sermons like how 3,000 were saved outside the ark. Think about it. It's a good sermon. And, of course, in the end, he proved that, that whole assertion to be wrong, and in doing so, proved that there's only one way to salvation, and that's inside the Lord's church. Um, old truth and new robes. That's what I'm talking about. I heard so many sermons growing up, and they were good sermons. And I hate preaching reruns. I hate preaching sermons I know all my audience has heard before. So what do you do? Well, here's my advice to you. way to keep your sermons fresh is look at things you like, hobbies or interests that you have. Work them in there. If they're interesting to you, they'll probably be interesting to somebody in the audience. Maybe not everybody every Sunday, but you'll get some some kind words, hopefully. And, uh, And you'll also have done your job of preaching the whole counsel of God and not just those issues that are right there in your forefront of your mind and maybe the most important to you, the most exciting. 